We're going to need a bit of caffeine for this one. I'll be right back. I suggest you do the same if you don't want to end this review in a coma. Way ahead of you. Let's get this show on the road. This is the Michael Almereda adaptation that was released in January of 2000 and is the most realized movie of the lot. It's a real film and uses the new medium to really do something. However, that something is poorly executed, dull, flat, and the best remedy for insomnia of the seven movies here. The visual cuts and the integration of the text into a modern time are admittedly beautiful. One little hiccup with that, though. CEO and King are not equivalent concepts, like, at all. Let's figure out the difference and then make a movie about a usurping leader. Other than that, the modernization works pretty well. It's only when the characters actually open their mouths to say Shakespeare's words that the movie falls flatter than their leading man's vocal inflection. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the Everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Oh, he's like an ambient. The ghost scene in particular, as badass as Sam Shepard is, makes me want to either fall asleep or jump off a tall thing, not sure which. To this film's credit, the modernized setting does give it one unique aspect, and that is its soundtrack. Songs from popular music acts of the late 90s are abound, including more Chiba and Primal Scream. In case I wasn't clear, this movie is boring. Boring. The acting is just bad. Characters on the precipice of unconsciousness is not an interpretation. I just want to grab Laurence Olivier back from the dead to explain to them that subtle does not mean comatose. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. Look out, Ethan Hawke, it's the bad guy from the Flintstones. Clipping and snipping of the story cuts the film together very strangely. Hamlet has almost no interaction with the rest of the cast, which means there's no reason for Claudius and Gertrude to be worried about his madness, they barely even hear about it. I have to wonder why everyone else cares. The cutting, while effective aesthetically, cuts the plot to ribbons. Which is why this movie is under two hours long. I was hoping that the runtime meant that they found a way to streamline the story, but sadly this wasn't the case. As Cassius said, they mostly took out the parts that would actually make us care, and I seriously can't think of why. Okay, one good thing. Polonius and Ophelia translate really well into the modern setting. They're different from their original characters, but effective and fully realized. One good thing. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat. Extinct in both. Even in their promises, it is a making must not take for fire. I do agree that Julia Stiles made an awesome Ophelia, but Bill Murray was a bit of a hit or miss for me. When he's doing well, he's believable as a concerned father. When he isn't, he sounds like he's, well, Bill Murray. One that is rather confused as to why he's in this production. Heck, I don't think he was the only one. His name isn't even built on any of this movie's posters. On to the rest of the characters. Horatio and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern translated so badly into dude bros, I can barely explain it. The fact that they're Hamlet's friends and inform Hamlet as a character only proves to me that emo artsy kid is a fail of an understanding of this character. If Hamlet were an emo kid, this movie's interpretation wouldn't crash and burn as hard as it does. Oh, oh, dude, did you guys just use a floppy disk? What's a floppy disk? Holy Jesus, I'm old. Well, that woke me up. Okay, first off, uh, yeah, lots of organizations still use floppy disks, up to and including the US government. Heck, a lot of them still use magnetic tape for data storage. Besides, if that makes you old, then you're the cool kind of old. Like a classic model car. Beautiful, sexy, and completely badass. I, however, would be a dinosaur. 
not the cool kind either. More like the kind with a ridiculously long tail and ridiculously short, useless forearms. Second, calling this interpretation of Hamlet as an emo kid is an insult to emo kids everywhere. This guy's personality and line delivery makes Dashboard Confessional sound like Barney and Friends. There's melancholy and they're sleepwalking through lines. Okay. The final scene makes me so viciously angry that I'm not sure I can do it justice. Sharky, rip it to shreds for me. God, not even Gertrude clearly trying to protect Hamlet can save this godforsaken mess of a scene. This fucking bullshit of a fucking stupid scene, as if having a fucking fencing bat on the fucking roof wasn't fucking All stupid right. enough. Yeah, uh, this scene. Well, it starts off with a fencing bat on the roof. That's not where the stupid starts. No, 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 no. It starts right about here. Come on. That is a pistol. Why does Laertes feel the need to walk up to him? Sure, personally motivated murders do occur at close range, but those occur with knives or other kinds of bladed objects and involve multiple stabs. Here, Laertes fires the gun so close to Hamlet that he manages to grab control of it and shoot back. As stupid as that sounds, I mean seriously, he could've just sat him from his seat and be done with it, we come across another problem. He's using a semi-automatic, which means that the slide actually needs room to move for it to actually work. It's why members of law enforcement prefer using revolvers when they're charging in with riot shields. Having no slide mechanism lets them fire while holding their weapon relatively close to their shields. Long story short, Hamlet and Laertes shooting themselves multiple times while at hugging range is pretty impossible. As if that wasn't enough, we then get this dialogue. The king. The king's to blame. In the context of Poison Blades, where Hamlet and Laertes would have time to talk to each other, this would be fine. Clearly, that's not the case. This isn't after a swipe with a poison sword, this is after he shoots Hamlet at implausibly close range. Twice. There is no other valid reaction for Hamlet here other than, YOU SHOT ME! And back to the technical stupidity, we now get the death of Claudius. Now this movie was rated R and he didn't shy away from the violence as proven by the fact that both Hamlet and Laertes now look like used tampons. So when Hamlet guns down Claudius, you expect blood. Instead, we get this. You don't see any of Hamlet's shots making contact with Claudius, yet there he is, twitching. If you're going to push for an R rating, be consistent with it. The only blood that ever emerges from the CEO of Denmark Inc. comes from his fingers. Why? and you can't argue that the bullets went straight through his torso. If that were the case, the entire wall that he was leaning on would have been soaking in his blood. No, it's just his fingers. Did Hamlet use homing bullets that we're not aware of? Even then, why would shots to the finger kill Claudius? Did his mother dip him in the river sticks by the tips of his fingers when he was just an infant? Oh, and if you're wondering why he seemed to care about this scene a bit too much, it's because the rest of the movie takes very little effort to make its audience care about anything else that happens in it. This movie is interesting in terms of what it does and has a lot to recommend it on a film student level. What it does with the play, however, is unconscionable, as it makes the entire thing seem as boring as fuck and overly melodramatic without any reason for being so. As a film student, I would recommend it as an example of concept versus execution. There's some fairly nice lighting work here, but other than that, it's a really generic motion picture if you take out all the Shakespearean lines. Ophelia using a wire to spy on Hamlet was an inspired choice, but just about everything else falls apart in an air of mediocrity. So ends our look at Michael Almereda's Hamlet. Next, we analyze a Hamlet interpretation that has something the others in this series don't. Guyliner. Until then, this has been Cassius. And this has been Sharky. Newsman with Gravitas, play us out. Our wills and fates do so contrary run that our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours. Their ends, none of our own.